Um, Google Earth VR, I, you saw the trailer. You know what to expect. I hope you've tried it. Um, can I see, hands up, who has had the experience of Google Earth VR? OK, that's a lot of you. That's great. Um, maybe the real question is, who hasn't? Oh, you guys are missing out. It's about half and half. Find one of these people that has, invite yourself over to their house, and then make sure they give you a demo. This is free. You can get it for the Oculus Rift. Sadly, not the Quest yet. Who knows? Uh, and on Steam VR for all of the Vive and HTC headsets. And it's an oft used phrase, but I'm going to call it magical. It really is. So, just to give you an idea of the experience, if you haven't tried it, you see some of the kind of images here. But the first thing you have when you slip on the headset, is just the planet right in front of you, just in exquisite detail. And you can take a couple of steps towards it and lean in and see these live cloud formations make its way across the globe. These are basically channeled in from satellites. It's about 15 minutes out of date. But you have this living, breathing view of the world where all of this takes place on. And then with a laser pointer in your hand, within seconds, you can zoom down, 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 down. And then you're flying across the majestic Amazon rainforest almost at the speed of sound, and then north over the equator, over the Gulf of Mexico, up the eastern seaboard of the United States, and then you see that beautiful city of Manhattan zooming towards you, and then you're in the canyons, and you're swinging from skyscrapers like Spider-Man until you maybe see something familiar, and you decide to settle on the Empire State Building, and the cameraman will thank me for this. Just take a little moment and have some peace and quiet, and listen to the sound, come up from the street, and a little bit of the wind whistling at that altitude. And you know what would make this slightly more fun? It's that a bit of atmosphere. You can reach up, pluck the sun from the sky, drag it west over the Hudson, and just make yourself a beautiful little sunset. Watch the lights go down. Watch the stars come out. And just realize you have this in the palm of your hand. It is like a dream come to life. Take your laser pointer, you ascend up into the heavens again, and then you have this beautiful little mode of dust hanging in the sunbeam. These are powerful images, and I want to share these with you and inspire you to share them with others and show you how we teach people how to fly. And it took us a while to get there because the UX for something like this is not obvious, and it took a lot of trial and error, a lot of things that we thought would work and didn't, and a lot of good old-fashioned testing and iteration. So we'll go through that process today. So a bit of background. How do you get all of this into a data center that can stream to potentially a mobile device with some of the handheld uh, Earth options or this beautiful stereoscopic 3D that you experience when you have the headphones on? or the headset on even. Well, it's a mix of different technologies. The first thing, you're very familiar with the satellites, and that gives you a great texture, but it doesn't really give you the terrain. It doesn't really give you Earth in 3D. So then we have these 3D uh, meshes. Well, th these are feature detected points, and that's built from low-flying aircraft. And then for street-level images that give us this kind of beautiful RGB texturing, we have cars, street view cars, surprise, surprise, and it all gets put into this beautiful hole which, if you see it on a monitor, looks nice, but it's still not quite there. So it's 3D, but it's not 3D yet. So how do we move it onto something a little bit more like this? Well, with a great deal of optimization. <clears throat> and we had a goal to run this at 90 frames per <coughs> second. See, I, it already makes me, that, that, that's quite a, that's a tough call. So we're having to generate stereo frames every 10 milliseconds. And we do it by a series of optimizations. I mean, the core one is simply reducing the level of detail with distance. We try and predict <coughs> where your head is moving, where you're going to look next, preload that, shuffle off geometry on the side, and all these little fixes that absolutely hit that frames per second, because anything less than that, you just get this sense of lag and nausea. Even if you don't perceive it, there's something in you that picks up on it, and you just feel a little bit funny. <coughs> oh, I didn't drink enough water this morning. So this is the founder of Google Earth VR. This is Dominic Kayser. Uh, he's a Swiss gentleman from ETH. I think some of you might know it. Um, very smart guy. Uh, used to work for Pixar. I used to be in charge of trees. Believe it or not, he did some very good trees for a range of different movies. But he created this example where he took the geometry as it exists on Earth, placed it in a room, and there's no controllers at all. It's just simply him with a six degrees of headset 
walking around and kind of bumping your head potentially on the walls as he's just about to do now. Um, and this was the demo that got us the buy-in from our stakeholders, which were actually Larry and Sergey in this instance. And for some reason, we had JJ Abrams in at some stage, and everybody seemed to love it and said, here's your head count. And it was a two-year process. We had a lot of people working very hard on this, and it became a very beautiful thing. But you can't just walk around a room. We've got to move through the world, and here are the solutions we found that work best for this with a few kind of dead ends along the way, if this works. So teleportation, you're probably familiar with this sort of grammar of virtual reality movement, and it kind of makes sense. You point, you jump, there's no nausea. But what we find is if you're standing at the foot of a hill and you want to jump to the top, all of a sudden, your complete field of view has changed. In an instant, you have a complete loss of context, and it's very easy to get lost in these circumstances. It's not ideal, but at least you're not kind of doubled over feeling carsick. <clears throat> so we tried, I feel like there's a box I should be pointing to. So we tried another uh, way to give you a different experience of the world, which is to scale. So sometimes you want to like, loom over a city like Godzilla. Sometimes you want to get up close and personal and just walk through your neighborhood or show a friend the place that you grew up. And so we had this ability of zooming you up and down. And the problem with this, of course, is the distance that can suddenly appear between the thing you were looking at a second ago and then where you wind up when you're kind of down and small. So again, it's not ideal, but somehow we can make a combination of these two that are going to work. And we came up with, well, the movement thing, the step teleport. This was our solution to the loss of context you get when you just appear. So instead of a straight teleport, we have it in these stages. We have this slightly uh, odd, uh, disturbing feeling when you look down mid-teleport. And if you let go of the button, you could just be hanging in space. And again, there was that sense of unease you would get because I'm anybody has ever paraglided, parasanded, parachuted. Uh, it takes a bit of getting used to. And we found with our users it was slightly disconcerting. Uh, so what about scale teleport? If we included both at the same time, this avoided this sense of disorientation because something just happened when we decided that we scale the world up and down in such a way that your feet are always on a ground plane. And you just, you, you do, you feel grounded. You don't feel like you're going to roll over or fall over, which in, in a bad experience, people, I've, I've seen people do some crazy stuff. And falling over is not something you want part of the, the, UR, the UX experience on Earth. So we keep playing around, and we just go, oh, OK, let's just fly all the way. Let's have this smooth transition. And of course, you'll know about the discrepancy between the inner ear and what the eyes tell you. Uh, and they're telling you two different things. Your eyes tell you you're zooming and accelerating. Your ears say no, you're kind of in a small uh, room. Uh, and it's just, it's, we're, we're not getting it yet. Here's the one that worked for us, or rather, here were the problems. The pure teleportation, which was the most comfortable, loss of context, the flying, sick as a dog. And I would have said about 95% of people found that just the native flying thing very uh, nausea inducing. And so we wanted to find a sweet spot between the context loss and the immersion loss, somehow, we want to kind of get in the middle of those two. We didn't want people to feel sick, and we didn't want it to become very complicated. We had a series of buttons to scale with this hand and to zoom with this or teleport, fly, all these different buttons that could be on there. Not quite what we're looking for. And this is a solution we came up with. Now, you're probably familiar with this concept. Um, this we called, uh, what's it going to be called? What would be a great name for this? Tunnel vision. That would be the name, wouldn't it? So you can see a couple of things happening here. Uh, first and foremost is this reduction of your field of view. Because the thing that gives you nausea is apparently high contrast images moving quite fast in your peripheral vision. And if we just bring that in, it kind of renders the view more like something in a television. And you could watch a car chase on a television set and not feel queasy, because you've got the, less, the rest of the living room around you just keeping you anchored to the spot. And that helped with that. There was a loss of context, but it was a price we were willing to pay. Uh, you can also see this little grid that's kind of overlaid in that little sort of fuzzy margin around there. Um, that gave you that sense of your feet standing. So even you're moving very quickly, you have that sense of solidity, which was very important. And then the final thing, there's this very clear horizon line, which helps with this idea of you feeling like you're going to teeter-totter. Uh, and just extending that out gave you something to fix your eyes on. And even if it was slightly towards the periphery, it was just these little iterations that, does this feel better? Does this feel better? And we no longer had to have a sick bucket in the room. We knew we were onto something. Uh, and there it is, the horizon line up on the top and the, the floor there that was the thing that seemed to be the solution for us. So we lost a little bit of the immersion with this reduction in scope, but it was a, a price worth paying. 
So what else did we come up against? Well, if you scale too high, you kind of feel like a circus elephant on a giant ball, kind of teeter-tottering. So we wanted to create that experience of just you looking at a map on a screen in front of you. And we did it by just putting Earth in front. And if you zoom out long enough, there's actually a button that switches. It's kind of debatable if you should just transition between the two. Again, it's this slightly disconcerting thing from Earth below to Earth in front. But putting it on a button allowed you to uh, preempt the transition and not be surprised when it happened. And it gives you what I think is the most magical view of it, which is just this great shot of it in front of you, which, of course, made us think, well, <clears throat> what other interactions should we have when we're seeing it in this mode? And of course, it's the equivalent of a, a left click on a mouse button. And you can drag the Earth geometry when you look down on top. And it made sense to do exactly the same thing here. And you just you feel powerful. You feel like you are literally moving the Earth. And they marry this up to a couple of interesting things I'll talk a bit more later. There's some haptic feedback in the controller. So there's a little bit of a rumble. You feel like you're having some physical interaction with a very heavy object. And then the sound designer we had actually went out. He was very good at going out and finding real world sounds, he found the biggest stone he could push, and just dragged it across some concrete and recorded it. And so there's this kind of earthy grating sound. It almost sounds like a zombie coming out of a of crypt or something, but it actually really works to give this sense of scale and the heaviness of what you're trying to do. And so it kind of works very simply. You can also, instead of flying, you can just say, I want to go to that pillar over here, drag it towards me. And very soon, you kind of wish everything in life was like this. Coffee queue, zip. Running for the bus, zip. Wouldn't it be nice? Um, and that worked pretty well until we had this kind of thing where, oops, oncoming train, you're kind of not on top of the mountain. You're in the mountain, and it's not really a great look for us. So the cone drag was developed. Now, this one is kind of slightly harder to explain, but a good example of this is if, uh, you know, that scene we had earlier with Manhattan skyscrapers, if you're standing on like a giant trampoline, it's very elastic, and you put the lip up against the thing that you're dragging towards, and then you press and drag along that line, basically your feet will move on this line here, and it means you don't kind of go through geometry. And it works either. Uh, kind of going from up down in like a pyramid shape or the inverted cone. And it just gives you this sort of smooth transition, which you can see here, which is a really thrilling way. And if you've ever been stuck in crosstown traffic, you would just, you would love to have this. Actually, small note, the Empire State Building looks like this because they were originally going to moor uh, hot air balloons uh, against it. What an elegant way to travel that would have been. So here are the solutions we had, the scaled flying, which gave you that sense of context because you just see everything coming past you. The tunnel vision reduced the nausea. The cone drag stopped you kind of going through geometry, giving you some nasty surprises. And the globe in front was just that sort of magical, it's what the astronauts call the overview effect. You know, there's something about seeing everything you know and love just there in one image. No borders, no countries, just this sense of a, a shared place. And it really kind of engenders a, a great sense of sort of stewardship. You just feel like, you know, you want to recycle when you see this picture. So talking a bit more about immersion, how do we create something that doesn't just look real, it feels real? Well, there are a variety of different ways. And one of them is just, let's get a nice atmosphere model in there. So there's a point where you're kind of coming up and you have a little bit of scattering. The nice gradient of the colors up there. Uh, these are some really nice images. And we've even we've, we've kind of rendered them with some, um, some great shaders. Some of the stuff you just can't run real time at this rate, but we did some renders with real sky, and it looks absolutely spectacular. Right now, it's just a kind of a flat blue. But the sound, as I mentioned before, is very important. And we wanted to create a different sense of feeling depending on night and day and altitude. So say in the middle of the night, if you're on ground level, and if you were traveling around, you'd probably hear some insect noises. So we have those in there, or it's birdsong during the day. A bit higher up, you get a kind of a, like a, the wind effect, depends on where you are and just quite how high you're up. Higher up, there's like a soundtrack, there's, there's a little bit of audio in there, and it gets more majestic. And as you get way, way up into the atmosphere, there's this almost music of the spheres kind of thing. And just this whole smooth transition, this sort of live mixing of the sound between, as I say, the night and day and the altitude just gives you like a soundtrack. Imagine if you had a soundtrack for uh, your everyday life. That also would make running for the bus a lot more fun. Um, but what about the physicality of it? How do we make it feel real? And what we found was with that initial dragging action, it just felt a little bit kind of janky. Um, I don't know if you can see from this, it just it, it's, it felt inconsequential. It felt almost like it was a giant paper mache ball with no weight. So it didn't really kind of convey the sort of the, the impact of what you were doing. 
So we decided to change it up a bit. And if you've studied any physics, you wanted this idea of a, a kind of a, a spring thing. So you actually have to kind of exert some energy into this thing. You've got to impart some momentum, get over the, uh, the now I need to, I'm trying to remember my physics here. Is it the, the static friction and then the, the sliding friction? There's that transition where you need to really give it a good yank. And it just feels right. It just feels like the world would work. So it's all these little things. And then the other additional thing, instead of this like perfect straight line, we give it a bit of a water hose effect. Uh, it kind of minimizes that dragging stuff from too far away. And it just, it just, it was one of these things that, that felt right. And you see it in this one here, there's a, there's a difference between the, the red and the white. The red is actually where the laser pointer would be attached to your controller. And then the white is this little bit of a curvature on it. It's a little bit of a delay. So you kind of feel like you're throwing a fishing line and kind of bending the rod a little to, to come up. But it just gave you that sense of you've got to work at this. You get a sense of accomplishment when you're zipping through the cities. Uh, this is what it looks like with that red line. And it just it, it felt smoother. There was a kind of ramp up of the motion through uh, your input, which just seemed to feel like the right thing. Now, the speed was an interesting thing. This is actually very difficult to explain, but imagine if you like, you're not really changing size in Earth. The Earth is changing size around you. And so scaled up, you might get Mount Everest in front of you or scaled down, there's just buildings around. But what we do is we tried having this static speed that basically meant you would move at, say, one room per second. So the idea of whatever was in that space around you would sweep past. And it seemed like a sensible thing to do. And we'd allow the difference in scale to kind of move you appropriately, but it just felt like you were stuck in treacle when you were down close on the street level. So it was something else that we thought, OK, we're not going with our preconceptions in this one. Let's go with the sort of the, the feeling. And so we kind of put this little power curve in here. So uh, at the street level stuff, you don't want to feel like you're trudging along, just that little bit of acceleration. You know the feeling you get when you're in an airport and you're kind of walking on a, uh, one of these moving platforms next to the schlubs next to you. They're dragging. They feel a bit like Superman. It's kind of that. It gives you that sense of empowerment again. And then we just have this nice curve. And it just felt like the right way where it was a little bit faster. And then effectively, you're slowing down at height, but it gives you that sense of, well, that the scale is there. It's going to take longer for you to move uh, through the city like that. But still very exhilarating. And then Street View. Um, I, I love the Street View product. I actually got the chance to work in this for a year as well. It's how I got into 360 imagery originally. And some amazing cameras, some of which never saw the light of day. But I'd also encourage you, if you haven't seen this one yet, uh, there's a great Vive app. I'm going to say probably in Rift as well, welcome to light fields. Um, that's, that's well worth checking out. This, this feels like a, one plausible future for photography. The devices are big, but the images are, are spectacular. Real, true 3D images, specular highlights, uh, refraction, parallax, all of this kind of thing. But Street View, we had all this great imagery already. And it did seem like an obvious thing to do. Let's drop it in Earth and give everybody the benefit of it, which is exactly what we did. So the first experiments with this, I think you can see there, we just had these globes dotted around. Uh, and it kind of worked in principle, but um, we couldn't do this for real. There would just be too many of them. Uh, and you can literally drag and drop little yellow pegman anywhere on the map. So we needed to find a way to best represent that. Uh, and it's useful because we have a lot of places around the world that we're just not allowed to fly low-flying aircraft for government reasons. There's always a lot of negotiation, military stuff. So there's, there's large portions and just the expense of mapping into our planet. But we do have permission to drive Street View. And so it would bring up these otherwise flat regions into something that actually gave you a better sense of being there. And so much as I enjoy the photogrammetry aspect of where Earth is, it doesn't give you that sense of kind of liveliness and bustle. Uh, and I think a Street View, even though it's a static image, you get this sense of a place. There's people there. There's movement. There's, there's something going on. You kind of feel a little more atmosphere coming from that. And so we wanted to really harness that and make the most of it. Uh, and we did. And so you'll recognize this kind of blue line. This is what happens when you drag the little yellow character around. Um, it kind of works quite nicely on the map. Uh, it's quite processor intensive when you overlay this and then occlude it on a 3D model. And then the kind of the joins looked a bit rough. And it also kind of broke up this kind of the beauty of just this sort of unfettered landscape. So it didn't feel the right uh, version for us. And so in the spirit of uh, iterate and test, we kind of came up with this rather frightening uh, rendition, which I'll just let you watch. I, who would do such a thing? <laughs> Something incredibly sadistic about that. Nobody makes their first jump. Just remember that. <clears throat> so we kind of moved on from that fairly quickly. 
And then we figured we're not going to kind of try and recreate the desktop experience in this. But we have something in your left hand. We actually have the whole planet. And there's something, again, powerful about this. You can just rotate this globe around as you look at it. And with a laser pointer, you could just drag and then pop up in whichever part of the planet you would like. Uh, how about using that sphere for a different uh, purpose? And so if you can see this little uh, dotted blue line there, that's kind of visualizing a threshold below which we're going to use the Street View bubble, and above which we go back to this kind of globe. And so it makes sense when you're a bit closer, you can sort of see what's going underneath you. What it does is it just basically scans where your feet are and searches for the closest Street View, and then it will sort of preview it in your hand in front of you. So you see this little switch, you go below the threshold level, and then this is what's directly under your feet at this point. And it also has this nice effect. You can actually turn this thing around without going to the kind of effort of going into it. You can just look within it. It's like one of these, um, oh, is it Lord of the Rings? You know those things, you have these giant balls, pal Palantir, Palantir. And this idea that you can look through and look around like a, a, like a window. I think that's how the black holes work, right? Um, it was a really nice way to do it, and it was as simple as just putting it over your head. It's almost like putting on another VR headset in a VR simulation. You start having really weird dreams when you start layering that up too much. But it was a nice transition to this view, and you could pull it off your head, or you could point and click to dispel it. Um, but it gave us that sort of discoverability, the little pulse. There's a buzz when you go below the threshold. You see it in your hand. You can put it on your head. You can take it off again, just like a really elegant way of doing it. And again, you just see it in action here in a really kind of comfortable way of moving around. And it's, uh, we've got so much material here. Somebody once told me, it's like, have you been here? Have you been here on Google Earth? And it's like, well, not really. Nobody has ever seen all of Google Earth. I think those days have long passed. And just as the world here is, is big, you're not going to see all of this either. And so every time you demo this to somebody, you, you find amazing places. You're kind of introduced to new places in the world that you think, I'd love to go there one day. And who knows, maybe this point gets to the resolution where you don't have to go there. You save your carbon footprint, and when you're 80 years old, you can travel the entire world and the kind of resolution that's, that's possible. I, mean, I, I think I said this yesterday as well. Go to the Vario thing. They have some photogrammetry on there, which just feels real now. I and mean, I kind of felt that a little bit with uh, Vive when it first came along, but this just takes it up a whole other level. So imagine this image at that kind of human eye resolution. is just terrific. So that was, that was it for us. We needed discoverability, and we needed an intuitive way to kind of go in and go out. And there's actually two ways, but people can usually navigate it quite straightforwardly, which was obviously uh, just what we were going for. So what was the response? Well, the thing that we liked about it was so many VR experiences can be very isolating. Uh, you put on a, a headset, and you're somehow removed from the people around you. They're not inherently social experiences. But how can we sort of turn that into something that, that's more interactive, that actually brings people together? And the response we had from this was people would just put the thing on their head and they would start to tell stories. And like you've all done on Google Earth, I'm sure, the first thing you do is you go to your house. And then you maybe go to where you went on holidays. And then you kind of think, well, I like to ski. Here's the ski resort. Have a look at that. I, I've gotten lost on skis because I cannot get this sort of map which has been weirdly kind of unraveled and flattened onto a sheet of paper. If, if you take the wrong lift, you're on the other side of a mountain and kind of a long walk home. <clears throat> and the idea, you can just look at hiking trails or ski routes and get a sense of how they sit in with the entirety is actually really useful as well. So there's a great deal of, of efficacy. But for me, it's just the, the tales that I hear people talk and this wonderful sharing that happens. And it kind of just comes very naturally when you see images like this, which should animate now. And again, this reminds me, if you've never seen it, this is on YouTube. 1977, I think IBM commissioned uh, Charles and Ray Eames furniture designers to create this really striking bit of a powers of 10 documentation. I was a fan of that. I saw this as a kid and was kind of fascinated by it. And then all of a sudden, to be able to have that literally in the palm of your hand, the globe in your hand. And here it is. So I'd love you to get out and try it. Please take some time to show your friends if you have one of these things at home. And uh, go out there and make some of this stuff yourself. This is powerful technology. We can transport people through time and space. I encourage you to do so. Thank you very much.